All right. For library today, we're going to continue listening to our audio book called Swipe. Um, we lift, we've listened to chapter one, which included parts one, parts two, and parts three. And today we're moving on to chapter two. And we're going to listen to part one, part two. And if part three isn't too long, we'll listen to that one too. So we can do all of chapter two together. So chapter one was a lot about the main character, Logan. In chapter two, I only listened to the first three seconds or four seconds, and it seems that they're moving away from him and starting to talk about something else. Um, so we'll see, because I'm listening to this with you guys for the first time, too. I know that we left last time on kind of a cliffhanger. Logan was very paranoid he thought someone had been following him uh, and the last thing we heard was him searching the house and then he thought he heard the door open or close behind him or something like that and he went to open it to see if there was somebody there so hopefully they'll come back to that soon so I looked up a little bit of information and I don't want to give too many things away I was looking up the cat the characters and there's a lot of people we haven't met yet so for logan his full name is logan langley and they describe him as a 12 year old boy so we find out his age quiet determined and somewhat paranoid so let's hear some more about that um with chapter one i mean sorry chapter two, part one All right. Chapter 2, Aaron Arbiter and the Government Work. 1. Aaron Arbiter was aware of her father's voice beside her, but she couldn't have told you what he was saying. His chatter filled the magnetrain compartment like a board conductor's while her mind wandered further and further away, past the blur of unfamiliar tracks, past cities and towns over mountains and across rivers, all the way back to Beacon City, her city, half a continent away and nothing like the humdrum destination she rode to now. Spokey, she thought, it would never be home. I don't know why we couldn't have caught an earlier train, Mr. Arbiter was saying. Soon as we get in, we'll have to register you for school. Then I need to get straight to the office and set up while you unpack at the apartment. Fine, Dad, Aaron said. She held her pet iguana up to the window so it could see an oily and polluted Lake Erie off in the distance. It's just a lot to do in one afternoon. I know, Dad. And you and I are both going to need to hit the ground running tomorrow. Mr. Arbiter shook his head. Not even there yet, and we're already behind kept saying we should have left on Friday. Aaron rested Iggy on her lap and emerged reluctantly from her daydream, caustic and angry. If only there could have been some way for us to stay with Mom and Beacon instead of uprooting our lives for no good reason. She shook her head, feigning for sympathy. Then you wouldn't be suffering such a terrible inconvenience. It was your mother's decision not to come with us. Mr. Arbiter said forcefully. He ignored Aaron's tone. She knows how important this job is, and not just to me, to the Union. Aaron sighed, caught square in the middle of a standoff between two strong-headed working parents. Just two months ago, Mr. Arbiter had surprised his family with the announcement that he had received a promotion at work and that they would be moving to Spokey to accommodate it. Aaron's mom, a top economic software analyst on Barrier Street in Beacon City, had told him precisely what he could do with that idea. Of course, Mr. Arbiter was certain it was only a matter of time before his wife gave in and found a way to keep the family together. But so far, she had not, and Aaron was left with no choice but to get used to a new town a thousand miles away while her dad played a game of spousal carrier chicken 
and her mom continued enjoying life in the big city back east. Well, anything for the Union, Aaron said sarcastically, and her father rolled his eyes. I mean it, he said. I took this job with good reason. You'll feel better about it once your mother's out here with us. She's not coming out here with us, Dad. She's waiting for you to come to your senses and tell Dome you can't just uproot your family because some bureaucrat's offering more money to copy and paste documents in Spokey than in Beacon. That's not what this is, Aaron. What about Mom's career, huh? What about my education? This is what's best for all of us, Mr. Arbiter said in a tone that suggested he'd been through this enough times with his wife already. When we are called upon, we make sacrifices. Some things are more important than... Than what? Than your family? How important can it be when you won't even tell me what you're needed for? I mean, maybe if I had some sense of what you were doing out here, at least I could wrap my head around... Government work, Aaron. Government work. Of course, Dad, Aaron said. In all his years at Dome, Mr. Arbiter had never once talked about the specifics of what he did. When friends asked, Aaron said what she was told to say, which was, government work. Even though she had no idea what that meant, somehow it just summed it up, said it all. If anyone pressed, she was supposed to say, Dome? Department of Marked Emergencies. But no one ever pressed. The weight of the first two words was enough. Frankly, Aaron couldn't understand what her father was doing at a desk job in the first place. When she was younger, he had been a Beacon police officer, and a good one at that. In those days, when they'd play games together, he'd swoop her around the room with one hand. She'd hug him at night after his long days of patrolling the city, and it knocked the wind out of her. Every time, she loved that. Now, sitting beside her in the plush Dome Reserve train car, Mr. Arbiter was balding, and what remained of his hair was too long and unkempt. His face was lined from stress, and he'd become soft and fat. Looking at him, there were hints of some of the strength he'd kept, the definition in his forearms, the width of his back, but nothing that would grab a person's attention, nothing to terrify a criminal in pursuit and Aaron resented him for it. Why he'd given up life as a hero, as a known hero in the greatest city on the continent, for anonymity at Dome, doing who knew what for higher-ups too selfish to mind transferring a family man halfway across the country, Aaron would never know. Been a nice ride, anyway, Mr. Arbiter said, after hours of silence, and despite herself, Aaron had to agree. She'd never been away from the coast before, hadn't ever ventured far beyond the closest suburb of Beacon. There'd never been a reason to. And anyway, long-distance travel was tough ever since the airline and auto industries collapsed. A plane ticket from Beacon to New Chicago would have cost several times Mr. Arbiter's annual salary, and private cars were mostly a forgotten luxury. Inner-city Magna train lines were just recently becoming reliable enough for cross-country travel, and even this trip was only really made affordable by the tickets Dome had supplied. Aaron had to admit she liked the feeling of it, of the smooth, silent tracks, of seeing the countryside pass and change. The Beacon Metro Rail trains were different, slow and loud and rough enough to make you sick and none of the lines went far enough out of Beacon for a change of scenery anyway. On the Magna train, the world transformed before her. The vast metropolis spreading out from central Beacon gradually thinned. Buildings shrank in both size and height, and city blocks eventually gave way to towns, which gave themselves in turn to wasteland. A satellite photo of North America at the time would have looked much like a grim, sepia-toned shooting range. Three enormous bullseyes dotted the browned and dusty continent, and Aaron was making her way between two of them now. The first and most prominent would certainly have been Beacon, which was the largest of America's cultural epicenters. Its rings extended up and down the eastern coast as well as westward their faintest influences reaching all the way out to the Allegheny River. 
The second bullseye would have been New Chicago, much smaller than Beacon, but very dense, and stretching far north to create a long oval, marred only by the Great Lakes and extending well into the area once known as Canada. The third and final bullseye of the American Union would have been Sierra City, the youngest and least developed of the Union's urban capitals. It had been within Aaron's lifetime that the old western coast was destroyed by the earthquake, but sprawling and lively nonetheless. Recently, the city had celebrated its growth into territory as far as what had once been called Mexico, before it all just became the AU, and Aaron was often told that if you could stand the heat, Sierra was a great place to live. Outside of these urban areas, though, North America was mostly uninhabited, and while Aaron had long known this to be the case, it wasn't until today that she could visualize what uninhabited truly meant. Along the ride, Aaron had seen a few vistas still dotted with houses, and a couple even covered with them, but those were rare sights. Mostly these days, following so many years of environmental disruption, the country was desolate. Its old cities and towns long abandoned and forgotten, occupied only by the most occasional and intrepid of settlers still willing to risk its climate of hurricanes, tornadoes, floods, wildfires, heat waves, blizzards. Consequently, the skies between cities was open and infinite, unobscured by a single skyscraper or overpass, except the occasional ruin and it seemed to Aaron that it might swallow her whole if she didn't hold on tight to her seat. As they rode north through the suburbs of New Chicago, just fifty miles out from the city's western edge, the development returned. But it was hardly the city life she'd grown up with. This was small town, and everything about it was unfamiliar. The buildings stretched only ten, maybe twenty stories off the ground. The streets were quiet and humble, scattered with pedestrians, but hardly any roller sticks or electrobuses. There were no treads on the sidewalk for automatic moving, no trams, no crowds. The building's sides were vinyl or glass or brick, and none were covered with the ground-to-sky advertisement and news screens from back home. Intersections didn't even have stoplights here. No one moved fast enough to need them. You're looking at it. Aaron's dad said as the train made its stop on the eastern outskirts of town. This is spooky. Half an hour into their walk through the quiet streets, Mr. Arbiter wasn't so jovial. Sweat pulled in the crevices of his shirt as he lurched and dragged an oversized luggage carrier behind him. Droplets beaded and rained down his forehead. He huffed and spoke very little. Aaron refused to help. It has to be somewhere around here, Mr. Arbiter said. He wiped his face hopelessly on the collar of his shirt. They passed Aaron's new middle school three times before either of them saw it. Two. I hate... All right, so <clears throat> we've met a new character, uh, Aaron Arbiter and her father. <clears throat> All right, let's listen to parts... Two. Eat this, Aaron said, standing at the edge of a large, empty field sandwiched between tall buildings on either side. I can tell already. The field was carpeted with plastic grass, lined with bleachers, and big enough for any variety of outdoor sports. At its edge was a track for running, and by the sidewalk was a small sign announcing the school's presence. The Spokey School of Middle Development. Middle of nowhere, Aaron said, and Mr. Arbiter walked with the luggage to a glass booth at the field's corner. I guess this is the entrance, he said, and they opened the booth's door and descended the long escalator into the school below. The halls of Spokey Middle were bright and warm with a natural light, surprising for a place so far underground. There weren't windows in the traditional sense, but the walls were indeed lined with glass, behind which were simulated three-dimensional video projections of vistas from all over the world. 
a reminder to the students of how things once were. Erin was impressed in spite of herself. Her school back in Beacon had hallways named for their subjects of learning. The math wing, the English wing, the science wing, but Spokey Middles seemed to be known by their views. There was the Amazon wing, with its windows looking out at ground level through the virtual trees of a rainforest from long ago. The Sahara, with a view of the sand dunes of northern Africa. The Pacific wing, recreating with startling accuracy the sensation of walking below the old ocean surface. The Arctic wing. The beach wing. Aaron walked with her father through what must have been the moon wing, rendering its view of Earth from Tranquility Base. The school's main office was just beyond the lunar module. Behind the front desk, another window looked out into an endless expense of computer-generated stars and planets. A small woman with short black hair sat facing away from the door, staring into their infinity. Excuse me, Mr. Arbiter said, and the woman jumped and spun around. I'd like to register my daughter for class here. I believe you got my message last week. Mr. Arbiter. Oh, yeah, sure, I remember. The woman spoke in an old-fashioned Midwestern accent that made Aaron feel farther from home than ever. Pleasure to meet you, Nancy Carroll. She extended her tiny hand to shake theirs. From Beacon, aren't you? Oh, sure. That's a long ways. It is, Aaron agreed. And what brings you to Spokey now? She asked as she pointed to a mark scanner on the desk. Business. Mr. Arbiter shrugged, and he and Aaron swiped their hands under the scanner. Miss Carroll read the back of the mark scanner and wrote some things on her tablet computer. And what is it you do? She asked. But before Mr. Arbiter could respond, the answer popped up on the screen she held in her hands. Miss Carroll's eyebrows lifted well into her forehead. Aaron couldn't tell if the woman was impressed or afraid. Government work she said. Mr. Arbiter smiled politely. That's right, and everyone knew that was the end of that conversation. 3. For lunch, Mr. Arbiter suggested they stop at the Spokey Diner for some loco flavor, and while Aaron had no desire to know what that was, they were soon looking over the menu in their corner booth. Beside them, a television frame flashed world news at a low volume, and their table displayed snippets from the local paper, which could be expanded and read by tapping on the glass surface. Aaron was scanning an article on a recent spoky kidnapping when her father directed her attention up to the frame. Seems Lameson and Silas are close to a treaty, Mr. Arbiter said, and they watched the television as the general-in-chief of the American Union met with the European Chancellor overseas. Aaron nodded. It'd be good for us, right? Best thing possible, Mr. Arbiter said. Anything to avoid another war. He swiped his mark against a scanner on the table and tapped his order into its interface. Besides, the Chancellor's ideas are good. His EU policies make sense. Practically every speech Lamson gives, he's singing the guy's praises. Everyone is. Mom can't say enough about how great it's been over there recently. <sighs> I'm aware. Mr. Arbiter rolled his eyes. She certainly visits enough to know. She has to, Dad. It's her job. And yet, I'm the bad guy for bringing us to Spokey. Let's not talk about it, Aaron said and she swiped her own mark to place an order. You know, your mom's not the only one foregoing unity these days. He waved his hand dismissively as he said it. Okay, Dad. What do you think we're doing out here anyway, huh? What do you think government work actually means? I don't know, Dad. You won't tell me. You think your mom's algorithms would do any good if there weren't people like me to... Dad, drop it. There was a pause. A waitress came by with Aaron's grilled soy cheese sandwich and Mr. Arbiter's tempeh burger. Enforce it, Mr. Arbiter said quietly. 
but Aaron didn't respond. The truth was, Aaron's mom was gone quite a bit. Ever since she'd had Aaron, Dr. Arbiter had worked increasingly from Europe, facilitating the merger of AU and EU economies as the Americas adopted Silas's MARC program under the encouragement of General Lameson. Now that a treaty was in the works to merge governments too, Dr. Arbiter was overseas half of each year. Will Lameson still be in charge? Aaron asked, watching the news on the wall. Of the American branch, sure. Mr. Arbiter was absorbed in his sandwich. What about Parliament? They'll still be around, like how it used to work with state governments in this country. Mr. Arbiter wiped his mouth on his sleeve. Why, you gonna run for office? What'll they call it? Aaron asked. Call what? The new country. On the television, Chancellor Silas was smiling and waving to the cameras. It probably won't happen for a while yet, Mr. Arbiter said. He pushed his plate away and stood up to leave. But when it does, Mr. Arbiter smiled. The global union, he said. And then there won't be any more conflict? Aaron thought back to the earliest years of her childhood, of how scary it had been, hearing bombs fall at night and gunshots each day, seeing bodies on the street, learning of family members who weren't coming back, the four billion people dead, or AWOL, gone for good. And that was already after the worst of it, after General Lameson had come along and turned the tide. Those were distant memories now brushed under the carpet of ten peaceful years without American borders or divisions. And yes, under Silas, the situation had improved in Europe, and in Asia, and Africa too. But somehow, the idea of a totally unified world, East and West together, it seemed too good to be true. Worth fighting for, sure. But possible? It's possible, Mr. Arbiter said swiping his mark against the table again and punching in a percentage for the tip. And this right here? He touched his own wrist and pointed to the mark on Aaron's. This is the start of all that. <clears throat> this is the symbol. This is what I'm in Spokey to protect. Okay, Aaron said, not knowing at all what he meant. They thanked their waitress on the way out. Okay, so we got a look at Erin Arbiter and her life and her dad. Uh, they also went into a bit of information about how the world is set up now and the government. So we can tell that this is definitely taking place in the United States in the future and that their government system is different than what we know of today. And they even reference the old states. Um, so maybe we can piece that together a little bit more as they go. We don't get to hear from Logan though. Um, next is chapter two, part four. So we'll listen to that next time. So we just really heard about Erin and her dad and we heard more about the mark. So apparently the mark, you swipe it, you know, it's, it's used to track you kind of for like everything. So that's pretty interesting. So I'm gonna post this and then I'll put more up next time. All right. I uh, hope you guys have a great day and you're getting all your schoolwork done and keeping yourself busy. Bye.